Hi, everyone. Uh, we're back. Uh, I'm thrilled this week to have Corey Kasten. So Corey is originally from New York, mm -hmm. and she has been in Florida for many years. Uh, she's been in nursing for over 25 years. And a little over 13 years ago, she started Platinum Select Nursing. Uh, and I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about that shortly. And that's actually how Corey and I came to know each other. Uh, three and a half years, for those of you who have read the blog, this is repetitive, but uh, when my mom had her health care crash in June of 2018, she spent close to a month uh, at Cleveland Clinic in Western Florida and Corey's company uh, places home health aides and um, nurses in homes to help uh, patients. And Corey was wonderful, came to the rehab. We had a wonderful conversation before, during, and after. And since then, we've remained in touch. And I thought Corey would be a wonderful person to have a conversation with about caregiving and advocacy and the bigger picture overall. I'm going to ask Corey to start with, I guess, her story. It's, I find it really fascinating, the story of how she started Platinum select nursing care, there's a great story behind it. So I'll, I'll let Corey tell us. I think everybody has a story. Mine is, um, so I'm originally from New York and I moved down to Florida. I was very unfamiliar with uh, private care. I had a very strong Medicaid background um, and then I transitioned to Medicare. And then uh, personal circumstances brought me down to Florida. So I uh, came down here and I discovered uh, the whole life of long-term care insurance and private duty. I ended up working for a company um, as a sales marketer, liaison type thing. And uh, I met this, uh, I was referred a client and I went to meet this gentleman and there was just such a connection. He was an elderly man, um, lived in a big house in a country club. Um, just sweet as can be. Uh, he actually uh, hired me to find him the right caregiver to take care of his wife. I was having difficulty kind of finding him the right fit. So I took it upon myself going outside of the office to interview people, see if they were a good fit, introduce them to him and his wife. And sure enough, we found a couple of really nice uh, certified caregivers. And then one day he says to me, he goes, you know, you're really good at this. He says, um, you really, you know, you're so invested in, in the relationship. And, and I'm sure that, you know, you're like this with your other clients. I hear your phone ringing. I hear the way you talk to them. He says, you know, I don't know if you know anything about me. He says, but I'm a very rich old man. He says, and um, he says, you know, I would like to lend you the money to start your own company. Did you ever think of starting your own company? He says, you should, you should, you, you do, you're so good at what you do. You shouldn't work for somebody. You should, I have, I have the faith that you could do this on your own. So long story short, um, a very close friend of mine um, would have to listen to me complain all the time about how the company that I was working for uh, wasn't really making the right connections, not finding the right caregivers, not screening them. And he said to me, he goes, you know, you should really take the old man's offer. You should really do this. He goes, I know you don't know anything about business. I'll mentor you for the business side. You know the nursing side and you should, um, you should really think about it. And I guess at the three and a half month mark, I got so frustrated. I just went to Harold and I said to him, you know, I'm ready to do this. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to take this, this leap of faith. And he goes, great. He goes, let's get in the car and go to the bank and we're going to write you a loan. <laughs> that is it's such a wonderful, I mean, it really is a wonderful story when you think about it. It's, it's one of those moments that I'm sure many people wish they had, and maybe they didn't have quite the same way, but it was a life-changing moment for you. It was huge. And, and I think it was because Harold, the, my client, was a businessman, and he just, he saw something that I didn't even see in myself. How has that then affected you? Have you had those experiences with other people? Has that changed how you have viewed others along the way? It makes you see past the outside and see inside. And I always said that my business, my success and my business were built on relationships. And as you get to know more about people and you see past just, you know, the, the, 
you know, the book cover, um, I tend to think you see things in them that, that maybe they don't see in themselves. And if you can bring that to their attention and give them the confidence and the, um, you know, open that door for them to just maybe the light bulb can go off for them themselves and they could say, you know, maybe, maybe I can do this. You know, maybe this is a road for me. And I've been in those situations too mm -hmm. over my career where it's, sure. you are, you're both coach and cheerleader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a great feeling. It's a great feeling when it pans out, when you see a light go off in somebody. It, it really is. It really is because somebody actually found something. And I always say people spend so much time looking on the outside for what they're, what they're needing. And I always say, it's, it's really inside you. You have to kind of like find it within. It's the same thing here with my company. You know, we're always looking for different avenues of revenue and, and, and trying to be competitive and see what, you know, be different than the others. And over the past couple of years, I've come to realize that, oh my gosh, we are filled with so much gold here from all the years of just our relationships and and having patience and our resources that if I just look inside here, I could dig my own gold and I could almost like recreate it and remold it into something else. And I stopped looking on the outside so much because we've built something here that harbors so much. It's information that's usable. I call it gold because it does turn into gold, you know, and it's interesting. And I think people spend too much time seeking and searching and looking out there for what's going to make them happy when it's really, it's it, the, the ingredients are really within you. Absolutely. It starts within. Uh, so from a practical standpoint, so he then said, let's go to the bank. Mm -hmm. And at that point, did you know what the practical steps were that needed to be taken, all of them, and what to start this business, or how did you go about that? You know, he rolls me into Northern Trust, and um, because he was, he was like he said, a rich old man, they opened up this boardroom in the back, and with the mahogany desks and the leather blotters, and I just sat there, and they kind of said, okay, well, here's a checking account, and here's an operating account, just sign here, and sign here, and here's your account, and he plunked a quarter, a, a quarter of a million dollars into it. Um, and then I said to him, I didn't know anything. And then I was like, well, now what? And he goes, well, now you're going to go and we're going to actually have a loan written up. Um, I just knew how to market. I knew that, um, you know, the, because it's a regulated business, there was a model that you have to follow. It's almost like step-by-step -step direction. So I hired a nurse to work with me and do it. And I just relied on my, you know, um, my best friend to help me through the, you know, the, the business steps. I mean, I didn't even know how to do books. The computer guy that I hired to set up my initial computers, um, he said to me, because, you know, do you know anything about bookkeeping? I was like, no, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking a marble notebook with columns. I could figure this out. And he said to me, because, well, I'm going to show you the basics. And he actually stayed with me for a couple of years. And he, he did the bookkeeping for me. I met a lot of good people and there was a lot of synergy and there was a lot of connection. So I kind of learned as I went. Um, and I was lucky that I had those trustworthy people. A lot of them stayed with me for quite a while. What would you say at the beginning was your vision? So this guy, Harold says, I'm giving you money. You get the money. You're sitting in the boardroom. You're, you're thinking, oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> I know so, so much money in my life. <laughs> right. And what was your vision? So now you had to have a vision for the company. I knew, so I knew what my competitors were doing and everybody had the kind of like the same problem. The problem at that time was I had a very um, middle-class to upper-class contacts, the clientele that I was marketing. I just knew that a lot of them weren't happy. And the reason why they came to me was because they weren't finding qualified aides. They weren't finding the level of, of, of human being, the level of um, compassion, the level of skill set that they were seeking to take care of either themselves or their spouses. And I would say to my boss, I would say, Steve, I says, we need to get better caregivers these clients want to use our services, but the caregivers are not meeting the, their criteria. And for a long time, I, you know, I went back and forth with him 
Um, and he, they just did not believe that that had, that had anything to do with it. They, the motto was, well, if you send somebody who's certified, they, they have a, they're warm and they have a pulse and they speak some English, everybody should be happy. It didn't make the clients that I serviced happy. So I started to have to go outside that and find and fine tune their process. And it wasn't until they wouldn't fine tune their own process that I ended up starting my own company. And I knew that was my focus because that was, I took all their problems and I said, I'm going to solve them in my company. So it was more the personal interaction and, and how the, the individuals would relate to the clients. That's what was a big component that was missing. It was huge because now I realize it's all about relationships. Back then I was, you know, I just needed better people. So what I did when I started my company, I actually interviewed each and every caregiver myself. I had a little desk set up in an office. They would come in. I had a couple of questions and I had a very simple criteria. You know, um, do they look you in the eye? Do they have a nice smile? Do they seem sincere? Um, you know, how was their communication skills? Um, and do they meet the ACA regulations for actually being, you know, um, a part of a home health agency? And I made these connections, which ended up turning into long-term relationships with these aides. And when you, it's like, you know, the old saying, you're judged by the friends you keep. So if they were a really good aide, and I would say to them, well, don't you have friends that do this? And normally the majority of the referrals of their friends would work out because they came from the same kind of, you know, model that the original aid came from. So that was kind of like my thing. Um, I just knew that I was going to be known for having the better caregivers because that's my product. That's what I'm selling. So in the 14 years or so since you started the company, I know you've seen a lot of changes uh, in the home care industry and what would you say have been, let's start with the top three positive changes that you've seen in the industry? Home care really is an extension of a hospital stay, a rehab stay, or it could be the long-term uh, decision that I'm just going to age in place at home. So with, with all the technology and the progression, we could actually manage a client at home with all different levels of acuity. Um, we, could, we could manage the dying patient. We could manage the patient that had a replacement, a hip replacement that's going to recover. And then we could also manage the long-term patient where it's a functional decline, um, whether it's cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, or it's a, a, just a, a, physic, a physical decline. Um, a medical decline. So, so much can be done in the home. There are resources out there that you can actually, and we've done it, where we've actually set up a little mini hospital room. So what people remember from back in the day, home care was more of like a babysitting service for old people. It could be, it yeah. could be just custodial. It could be custodial with some skilled care, with some medical care. It could be all medical. Um, people are more comfortable in their home people recover better in their home. Um, there's less risk factors from being in a hospital or a long-term facility. So the progression that I've seen is, is really amazing. And I think that that's really the future. So it's interesting, you mentioned setting up a hospital in the mm -hmm. home or heading up a hospital room. So have you as a company collaborated with or worked with companies like Medically Home there are different there are different companies out there that are very focused on doing that. It, home care, I'll never forget the, the one woman I went to work for when I first started um, in the home care industry. She had said to me, home care is like a circle and it's like a wheel and it has to keep going and going. Once there's a break in that wheel, everything stops. The wheel is a team. The team has to be strong holding hands and the wheel keeps going. So part of the team that we create is we work with Medicare agencies for the skilled care. We work with medical equipment companies to actually get the physical equipment in the house. We work with infusion companies if there's infusions going on in the home. Uh, we work with home pharmacies to get the meds into the home. Um, we, we provide either the aid or the licensed nurse to care for the patient. We now have doctors that come to the home 
uh, for home visits. We have a psychiatrist that'll come on board uh, to do a home visit. So we've taken just about everything out and we've, we've recreated it into the home. And, and the costs could vary depending on what the level of care is. We bring physical therapy into the home. I mean, it's really amazing these days of what can be done. Um, and, and, and you could be home with your family at the same time. You know, we don't have to worry about visiting hours and, and restrictions and all that stuff. So it's just, it, it's, a, the food is better. <laughs> you know, you get to sleep in your own bed a lot of times. So there's a lot of comforting supportive measures that go along with getting care in the home. How has technology helped your business in the past 14 years? Because obviously a lot has advanced in different ways. Mm -hmm. Can you think of a couple that have been just so integral in helping? But since the whole pandemic, it's really now elevated all the additional services that you can actually utilize um, for technology. Uh, we had this, this telemonitoring. So there's uh, companies that will bring in equipment where they can... Um, they can assess your heart rate. They, I mean, the iPhone, you can get an EKG on it nowadays. You know, so everything like that, it, 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 that's amazing. Now they have, everything is televisits now. So you don't even have to go out to your doctor. He can look at you or even the fact that you could shoot a picture. A lot of times the doctors say, well, shoot me a picture of what that wound looks like. This way they don't have to come into the office and we could give you wound orders. Um, so it's really, it's really facilitated a ton of things. A lot of clients put cameras in the home because the kids want to see mom and how she's doing. Because I have, a, I have one client, she's a lovely lady. Um, she's a cancer patient. For the past three years, we take care of her only one day every other week. And we just take her to a, a chemo appointment. And the daughter calls me and she goes, I see my mom declining. She goes, my mom refuses to get anybody else in the house, but I have a camera focused. And I could see she's tremoring, she's this, she's that. So it's amazing how, you know, there's so much involvement. Absolutely. It's I'll give you an example from our end. So well, I, I could give many, of course. But So ever since you met my mom originally, mm -hmm. uh, and then I guess it was a year ago, especially when my dad started going through his journey and was diagnosed with cancer and all the appointments and the treatments and so forth. So what I do have done since then is I use Zoom mm -hmm. and I set up three different devices in three places where she's going to be. And my brother and my sister tag team. And okay. just so, you know, she's knock on wood. <laughs> she's okay. And she's been okay. But in case there's a fall, she had a fall uh, and she broke her hip that prior to that. So it's just amazing how technology enables that. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole slew of stuff out there where people can monitor from a distance. And I'll tell you that we'll get a call um, and they'll say, you know, I noticed this. Can you send somebody out there to take a look at it? And at that point, yeah, now, now we need to, you know, investigate and see, but if they didn't have that monitoring system in place, you know, that daughter wouldn't have seen something that looked funky to actually call us to say, you know, I saw this, what do you think? Can the aide maybe keep an eye on this and, and maybe, you know, have a nurse come out or, you know, should I call the doctor kind of thing? So the whole communication has totally changed, which is, is a really good thing. And you know what, it's funny because you don't even have that close monitoring when you're in a hospital. You have to hope that they're going to come in, answer the bell, you know, uh, check on you um, or do rounds. There's really a high quality of care that you can get at home. And sometimes it is an alternative to being in a facility. Absolutely. Yeah. And everybody's situation is different. Everybody's yes. comfort level is different. There's just so many factors in it. But I agree that I agree with you, as you know. At this point, you know, we've touched on your journey and so forth. I kind of want to get into the patient advocacy because that's something you and I oh, we can go call out. a hot button for us. <laughs> it's something we, we've talked about. And we're both very passionate about it. Uh, you know, whether it's a caregiver or for a, another person, a family member or otherwise, um, what are some of the major challenges that you see? And I know we've talked about them, but I'd like for you to, and we'll go with this as we're talking, that you see, let's just talk about in the US since that's where we are with patient advocacy. 
Um, there's so much on this topic that's universal. It's such an important integral part of healthcare. Um, the frustrating part for me is that it's not recognized yet, or it's not recognized by uh, physicians, um, because there, there should be a, a component when you're doing total care or, or, or managing someone's care, there should be an advocacy component to it. You know, if somebody just wanted to become a patient advocate, you know, there are programs you could take to become a certified geriatric care manager or just a certified care manager. Um, it's a training, it's pretty extensive, um, but it's not required. Um, a lot of people have taken on the role just naturally because of a, a, a neighbor or a friend or a loved one and they they kind of put their own pieces together based on what the needs of that person is the sad part is that there's no there's no real compensation for that to be a standalone business or service um, a lot of people feel that it's not that necessary so they're not going to hire somebody that does it professionally i would love to see that uh, insurance companies or medicare uh, there, there it, it would be a covered service because it's so needed because if you had if you had somebody you know uh, advocating for you i think that in the long run it would save a lot of money i think that people would get better care the outcomes would be tremendous it would be a huge benefit to the medical provider to be able to speak to somebody who is is capable of making decisions instead of speaking to somebody who's really infirmed and you're asking them to make a decision and they're so sick and they're so stressed and they're so overwhelmed they they're not capable of making a decision never nevertheless the right decision they have case managers in hospitals they don't really advocate they should be trained to be able to advocate for that patient or be more involved instead of just setting up um, a, a discharge. Um, there's so many different levels of being an advocate. You know, are you a, a, a mouthpiece for that person? Are you making decisions with that person or for that person? We always have this um, this thing about you know what is a power of attorney and what is a legal representative and what is an advocate because they're all kind of related, but they all have their own specific roles. I think people need to think about that. You know, as you get older, who's going to make these decisions? Which one of those three categories do I need? Do I need all of them? Do I need one of them? Elder care attorneys are phenomenal people to go to to kind of get those um, those your your eggs in in the right row, and they'll they'll you know explain all the the legal part of it. Um, they work with some of them are advocates, and so a lot of them work with advocates. Absolutely, I. In thinking about this, as much as we've talked about it, and I've talked about it ad nauseum, think about decades and decades ago and decades ago in schools, and the girls were required to take home ec, mm -hmm. and they would take home economics, and that, you know, has gone by the wayside because of the way society has evolved, thankfully, and, but there should be something around this just as an awareness at an awareness level that starts at a young age and they understand and they start understanding what this is. And then to your point, I know there are companies out there that do train advocates, but most of the advocates that are out there, most of the caregivers that are out there are family. It's family, mm -hmm. it's family yeah. friends. And so they're the ones who end up, a great majority of them have not planned. You know, no. you're thrown into a situation. You end up in a situation. I ended up in a situation because things happen so fast. You don't know. In those times, it would be wonderful to have resources that could help uh, a go-to organization or organizations that are set up. And I don't, I don't know how to go and set that up, whether it's governmental, whether it's private, whatever, some, some combination. But how, to your point, it definitely would help outcomes. It definitely would help financial. And those are the things, especially that healthcare organizations look toward. Those are what the providers want. 
Uh, yeah, we had that conversation not long ago about, um, you know, I had told you about my experience uh, after a mammography and they had what they called a nurse navigator. And I think that organizations, healthcare organizations, physicians, hospitals, diagnostic centers, that would be a place where they should have those type of people because they're getting the patient at the point of diagnosis. And, and maybe, you know, they should, they should be, that should be the starting point because they could say, you know, you're going to have a lot of decisions, you know, you need to have somebody let us help find you somebody or let's give you the resources and you appoint your own son or daughter or whatever. And it's because people end up doing advocacy in the crisis mode. And when you do things in the crisis mode, you're short of time, you can't process, you can't, you know, collect all your information. You'd be surprised how many people don't even have um, living wills in place. I guess it's all part of a picture that nobody wants to think about they're gonna die or they're gonna get sick or they wanna deal with it. Um, I always say kudos to those families that have, have everything so organized. You know, and then that time comes and like, oh, well, I already set this up already. And I know it just makes it so much easier for everybody involved. Definitely. And especially in a society, unlike a lot of other societies where it's a given, where mom and dad get sick, the child's taking care of it. it it's yeah. there's so many other cultures where that is. And yeah. it's, it's less so here. And especially exactly. as the U.S. has grown and expanded and it you used to have the nuclear families that all mm -hmm. lived in the same area. But as things yeah. people started moving for different opportunities and else otherwise, mm -hmm. that sort of has dissipated. I agree. And especially more so here in Florida. <laughs> Most people don't have a lot of people. Their kids are just elsewhere because this is not the place they started in, but the place that mom and dad came to. We've covered so much. Uh, which is great because I'm looking at my my outline that I had shared with you and we just went into pretty much every point that yeah. we talked about, which is great. Uh, I, I guess just a couple final things on the patient advocacy component because that is really, so for one day, one week, that's one of my big missions. Uh, number one is to help bring more attention to caregiving and patient advocacy uh, and the importance of it, what it is. I think it was maybe Rosalind Carter because she has that whole caregiving initiative. Mm -hmm. And and I won't, I'm gonna misquote this, but the essence of the quote is everybody at some point in their life is either going to be a caregiver, in need of a caregiver, or will be a caregiver. Mm -hmm. So it's so important that we understand what that is. It, it's so true. And it's, it, it's like if there could be just some sort of, I mean, they talk about it all the time, you know, with government funding and, and the, you know, the statistics of the generations aging and how is this country going to manage that huge amount of people that are going to need care. We're in, you know, we're in right now a major um, healthcare crisis with just nursing. There's a huge nursing shortage, you know, and that's also caregiving. There's going to be a huge crisis because we're going to be in, in a caregiver shortage. So people are going to be forced, families are going to be forced to be family caregivers as opposed to finding and hiring and affording professional caregivers. Um, people have to leave their jobs to take care of their parents. I mean, there's got to be some sort of, you know, compromise to allow families to still support your family, but also to take care of your parents. And the more people can prepare themselves for what is going to come. Like I see it a little bit with my parents now they're getting on, they have a little bit more needs now. So I'm trying to think, how is this going to play out? You know, it's only me and my sister. We're very lucky that we're both down here. Um, but people need to really start thinking about that, you know, um, just because if you plan it and you have an idea of what your resources are and you find out what your, your loved one's wishes are so you don't have the conflict component, it's going to make your life a lot easier. It will. Uh, planning is key. 
-hmm. Now, as we all know, best laid plans always change, but at least you're starting from a place of knowledge and understanding Correct. and you've had the conversation. It's a lot easier, quote unquote, to have those conversations, or at least you would think so, before you're in crisis mode. Mm -hmm. Because as you had pointed out earlier, when you have somebody who's going through a serious health situation in the family, everybody's just unbelievably heightened and worried mm -hmm. and to think straight. So if you can think through those things first, have it ready, know that the plan can change and often will change in ways. Oh yeah. But at least you have a baseline. Mm -hmm. That's the whole thing. Just get something in place to kind of get you started when the time comes. And I would like to have your further thoughts of, so in every, in all of my uh, podcasts or in all of the blog articles that I write, no matter what I write about, whether it's my parents' journey, whether it's music and the power of music and whatever it might be. I always, in the takeaways, because I have a takeaway section, I always put in there the importance of the individual, the patients and the advocates to read and understand the AHA Patient Bill of Rights mm -hmm. as a baseline, because so that they at least feel empowered. So what are your yeah. thoughts about that? I think people need to know that what their patient bill of rights is and whether they're home, whether they're at a doctor, whether they're in a facility, um, people don't, don't, um, don't know and therefore they can't take control or responsibility because they don't think that they have the control to do that. It's really super important because people should have the right to make the right decision for themselves. You know, just because the doctor said that, or just because the doctor said you need to use this neurologist, people really think that whatever the doctor says is kind of like set in stone. And a lot of times, you know, that might be a great neurologist for a patient, but may not be the right fit for you. You need to know that you can, you know, you don't have to take his referral. You can get your own. Sometimes people want to be told because they don't want to do the work. You know, um, but I always say, you know, you have the right to pick and choose. You don't have to feel that you're, you, you're pushed into something. You need to, you need to understand, you need to make the decision and then, and then go with what you feel you need and you want and what's best for you. Absolutely. It's so important for patient advocates, patients, family members to understand that understand. they have rights. They have rights and they need to know what their rights are. Exactly. It, it, it's really, it, it really opens up a huge, huge, um, it, it, it's just, it's, it's such a big piece of, of what needs to be done. It's, there's so much education that needs to be brought out there, how to educate people, where they can get the education, what place they can come to, you know, almost, you know, um, I don't know why it reminds me of um, that financial thing that Susie Orman has where she wants to get everybody, you know, uh, financially set with all these things. And, and I saw it once on an infomercial that she did. I was like, wow, that's a really cool thing. And it's almost like something like that needs to be put in place for, for this because people need the steps. If you give them the steps to get where they need to go to, there's a good chance they'll do it. They just don't know what the steps are. They don't know, most people, have, they just don't know where to start. Absolutely. Maybe it's giving them, you know, the, the steps and the direction just to get them on their way and then things start to fall into place. True. But people have to think about it. That's the whole thing. They have to start thinking about what if and what am I gonna do and how am I gonna plan? Nobody likes to plan on stuff like that. It's a hard thing to talk about. It's a hard thing to do for sure, especially within families. But this is really just, you know, it, it just doesn't impact you. It impacts, it's a family, it's a unit, it's another person, it's more than one person. And, and that's where families can actually come together and, and put an initial plan together, come up with a direction book for them, a guideline. Absolutely. I'll put that on the to-do list. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On that note, I'm going to say thank you. You're very uh, welcome. I, as always, I 
enjoyed talking with you and this has been great. And hopefully everybody who's watching this has come away with uh, some new information that maybe they can take and can help them as they're considering what to do for their loved ones and in terms of patient advocacy, caregiving and so forth. Uh, they're certainly welcome to call either of us at any time about any questions. Right. And uh, yeah, so thanks again. I know we'll be talking again soon. And, Absolutely. And Absolutely. Uh, enjoy the rest of your week. You too. And, and like, I agree with you. If people just need to take a little bit of time, think about it, speak with their family, what the wishes are, um, and just put a preliminary plan together. Just take the time to do it. Take the time. And call us if you need any, have any questions. Absolutely. All Great right, Corey. You again, Todd. Take care. You too. Bye, -bye. Bye honey. primary purpose of the podcast is to educate. While guests are invited to listen, listeners acknowledge that they are not being provided professional advice from the podcast or any guests. One Day One Week and its sponsor, 17 Commerce LLC, expressly disclaim any and all liability or responsibility for any direct, indirect, incidental, special, consequential, or other damages arising out of any individual's use of reference to, reliance on, or inability to use the podcast episodes or the information presented in the episodes.